Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, being this ARIM session. Before I start with my uh, keynote uh, presentation, um, I, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit more about the, uh, the journal. Uh, Jim, uh, uh, first of all, now that I have the opportunity, uh, I, I want to thank uh, Rosella. I want to, th to thank ADEIMF for inviting me to be uh, the editor-in-chief uh, starting in, in, in last January. Um, and uh, for all the, uh, and for taking and uh, and discussing all the uh, ideas that uh, my, uh, the editorial board members and myself had for uh, for the journal, um, the probably this move by the journal uh, was aimed at trying to um, to become more international. Uh, I mean, but we must recognize that uh, we need to grow from the strong Italian base that already has. So we need to recognize that big effort already or already made and the franchise value that already has uh, because of the very strong Italian foothold. But of course, these these days, uh, I mean, uh, there are no barriers, there are no frontiers. So we we need to uh, to consider Europe and even further beyond. So uh, so we've taken uh, a few uh, steps in, in, in the journal, a first few steps, more will come. Uh, first, we've uh, renewed the editorial board to, uh, to involve uh, well-recognized scholars from other places of the world, particularly from Europe. Uh, we have Stephen Ongina, we have now Phil Molyneux, we have John Wilson, Douglas uh, Cumming, uh, we have Oscar Arce, we have uh, Francisco Rodriguez, other uh, other people, and of course the Paul Olivero and, and the people that uh, are already here uh, at the board. Um, and that's um, uh, I, I think that's a big step. There are other ideas that of I also want to share with you about the about the, about the future. At this point, I want actually also to to thank uh, Paolo Motura, the, the former uh, editor in chief. Okay. Um, so, uh, because he's been very helpful and, uh, and, and, and it's been a very smooth uh, transition. Um, what other ideas, uh, what other uh, ambitions the, the journal has? Uh, f of course, the journal uh, doesn't want to become international just by, by that. I mean, because what we want to have is relevance I mean, for in, the, in the banking and financial analysis. That's what we actually want. So we would like to, to be able to be eligible for impact factor uh, soon. I mean, as soon as possible. Of course, we need. Uh, we already meet some formal requirements for that, but probably we we need to uh, to have other. You know, there are certain rules that you do you have to meet for some uh, for some time. So we want the the journal also to be accredited with something that is, is very important for all the academics, is uh, because they we are asked to publish in, in in journals that have an impact factor, and of course, the and the highest the uh, the better. Um, as I think Jan Paolo has mentioned already, uh, typically, and we, we haven't changed that, and we don't have any plans to change that, we have two issues every year. Okay, um, So we are closing now, number one, for this year, uh, for this just for number one slash 2017, and we are already working on the next two, three ones. Uh, typically, we want to have uh, one of the issues to come from an special, actually from uh, a, an, a conference, uh, from uh, an special issue, I mean, coming from the woodworks from that uh, come out of, of a conference. And we've already, uh, with this conference and with another one, we already have plans uh, for that. But of course, there is also the, as any other journal, I mean, you can, uh, submit through the uh, we have the, the the web and the and the and the platform uh, the submission platform in El Molino and anyway if you Google JFMI you can you can find uh, easily the way to to submit it and so our aim is to improve the quality the standards to meet I mean the top standards as soon as possible okay so that's the idea. This takes time. This is not going to happen overnight. Okay, but this is the aim, and uh, I'm sure with your contributions, uh, 
that this could I mean this could happen and the contributions we, I mean from these very good excellent uh, conferences that aim at excellence that's very important uh, too okay uh, of course this is work in progress uh, there are more things that uh, probably will will come because this is I mean uh, this is changing all the time, so uh, you know it's an open access uh, journal, uh, and uh, so um, I don't know if you want to, to know anything else, but probably it's, it's time for me to start with the with the keynote, no? <laughs> and anything you need, please ask uh, because we we will be happy. So I think I should move there. Yeah. <coughs> Okay. Could you, could you give me a minute? Yes. yes. I'll try. Sorry. No, no, no. Thank you. Okay. The topic I'm going to, to discuss is a topic that I've been working over the last few years uh, and, and, and publishing not so much on FinTech but on financial digitalization and payments. Uh, but now, of course, FinTech is like uh, a pan world and everybody's talking about, about that. Uh, this is going to be partly academic, but also partly provocative and, uh, and, and, and based on some of the practical issues. So, uh, and, and, and because I think we are experiencing uh, a real, I mean, big wave of change for the banking industry. Um, the banking industry has been declared dead for many, many times. Okay, I remember 30 years ago when the very strong disintermediation process. Uh, the I mean, everybody believed that banks were going to be disintermediated, disintermediated away to death, and it didn't happen. However, this is uh, a bit different. I'm not going to say that they're going they're, they are going to die or they are going to disappear, but there is something. That I, I'm, I'm going to start with that because I think it's a bit provocative. There are very few investors that want to invest in a bank now, or in a financial intermediary. That tells us something. Uh, it may tell us that the return that you can get on the equity of a bank is not as good as you, if you invest in any other economic or financial activity. It may tell us that is they are so badly or so heavily regulated that the return they get is like a utility. Or it may imply also that investors believe that at least a great deal of the banks or the bank business is going to be replaced by something else, something new. But it's quite difficult to find investors with appetite to buy a bank. I was surprised, uh, you know, this, this week my country, Spain, was in the news, well, last week actually, because we had a bank that ha had a problem, well, a serious problem, coming out of the uh, housing bubble that we had in 10 years ago, but still we had a bank that had trouble, actually a private bank, popular. And uh, there was another bank, Santander, that was willing to, oh, it's true, to pay a euro. Well. A euro is, is not much, but it has to increase its capital by seven billion, which is a bit <laughs> it's a bit different story. So I was surprised that Santander you know, was uh, brave, or was like a conquistador in that sense, and they were willing to take that. I say that because one of the some of the most important competitors of banks are the new big technology uh, tech companies. I'm referring to Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, anyone you want, Apple. They have huge piles of cash, huge. Between the, among these three, four or five, they can buy the top 30 banks in the world at current market prices. Why don't they? Why don't they enter in a single bank? So that's another provocative idea. I mean, are they going? To, do, do they believe that they're going to replace all the banks by offering through uh, the smartphone, particularly smartphone or the tablet, 
are they going to, I mean, you know, they are using the data, the big data in a very useful, trying to be, yes, provocative, but, but I think that th these facts at least, uh, uh, to me, they, they are uh, not just a curiosity, something that is difficult to, to explain. So I'm, I'm going to try to, uh, to cover three areas. Why does the new economy, called the new economy, like, which is mean for financial intermediation, Second is uh, digitalization and banking theory and the new competitive environment. And the last one is the case of payments, okay, which is uh, the w an area I've been working, I mean, a great deal over the last few years, uh, and some of the regulatory challenges and financial stability issues and the conclusions. So what does the new economy mean for financial intermediation? Um, financial institutions, of course, well, that, different levels and depending on uh, how big you are, I mean, how, in how many countries you are, etc. But even if you are in many countries, this is something that is an, uh, something that that is important to tell. 20 years ago, when you were, when a bank was doing banking in France and then bought a bank in Mexico, the business model was different. So they had to learn, or they had to change, or they had to adapt the business model in Mexico. Today, it's happening something a bit different. Digital banking is the same here as it is in France, as it is in Spain, in Argentina, or Singapore. Okay. So that's uh, an important aspect of the business and of the competitive uh, environment that we may end up, because it's becoming global some of the instruments and some of the apps. So uh, we need to be careful about that. I mean, at some point, when you were expanding into another country, you had to change a, to a little bit to the model of that country, but not so much on the digital banking front, because it's basically the same. So financial institutions, banks are facing digitalization as a conundrum. There is a wide a range of alternatives that can be chosen as new services, uh, our information processing channels. And I think this is, as I mentioned before, a transformation that goes beyond the banking industry and blur its boundaries. It's not new. The change started 30, 40 years ago when with ATMs, with all the automated uh, proce processing, uh, backdoor processes in the, in the, at the banks, etc. But of course now it's been it's speeding up fast. Okay, so uh, and it's quite important. And it's happening in other sectors. The financial industry has had the impact of what's called the new economy. And of course, in the case of the financial industry, it's a bit different because it incorporates challenges for macroeconomic policy, which, I mean, the new economy has affected many things we know, and I'm not going to be repetitive here. We all know the cases of Uber, we know the cases of Airbnb, we know the cases of Spotify, we know, you know that's changed some of the well-recognized industries in, 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 in the world, but now we are talking about fintech, so it's changing as well the, uh, the situation of the banking industry, of the financial industry. So, what is different about the uh, fintech or the digitalization of financial services? As Lee proves and, and mentions, digitalization is producing an enormous, or there's a type of there, accumulation of intangible capital that potentially may create financial fra fragility. We have a large number of highly leveraged industries around fintech. They're very good ideas, they're very good. But let's not forget that this is also happening here. Philippon describes fintech as an industry that covers digital innovations and technology-enabled business model innovations in the banking financial sector. In a way, it can democratize, I mean, I mean, make more democratic, democratize access to financial services, but it also creates significant privacy, regulatory, and law enforcement challenges. We never complain when we use Facebook. Probably you've been doing that, Facebook, Twitter, or whatever, 
today or yesterday in Italy? Or have you been looking at kayak, I mean, Google? And suddenly, they have very good technology, I mean, a technological team using very well the big data. You get immediately, in the next screen, you get products associated with your last search, with your last, oh, they've detected where you are. Imagine if a bank dares to do, to offer you something based on the private data they have from us. It's true that we click on the cookies and we say, you accept it? Okay, that's, that's true, but, but uh, they are, uh, and that's one of the aspects, they are being a much more efficient, productive at gathering and working with the data they get from us. Because of course we have the sensor of the smartphone, we have an, so an, of our search, etc. But this is, I think that's a very important aspect that may, but don't forget that the banks are at the very end information gathering and information exploiting, uh, exploiting uh, uh, businesses. Okay, so this new financial intermediation with huge amounts of information processing, big data and new delivery channels is uh, a large part of the story is a business where the distance between households, small firms, and their lenders will be increasing and communicating in more impersonal ways, as predicted by Peterson and Rand. You don't need to go to the, I mean, next door branch, okay? And banks will interact with new players from the FinTech business in various ways, from first competition, in some cases, to cooperation. Regulators will then need to check whether regulation offers a level playing field. Okay. Let's move to the digitalization and the banking, the theory, and the new competitive environment. I'm going to refer to actually an old paper, an old paper because it was presented a few days before 9-11, 2001, by the Long and Summers at the, the well-known Jackson Hole meetings. Um, this is a paper on the new economy. They already talk about the new economy. And uh, it was quite controversial at that time. Of course, there, I'm going to refer to the areas I think are, are relevant for our purposes. They show, not they show, they show that for m most of the 20th uh, century, price discrimination, charging one price for one consumer at a different price for es essentially the same good for another consumer, was seen as a way for monopolies to further increase their monopoly profits. However, they already say that in 2001, in the information age, the background assumption may be different with price discrimination beat being an essential mechanism for attaining economic efficiency and social welfare. Industry should have incentives to invest in technology and price discrimination offers such incentive. This is difficult always, but it's also more difficult where many industries, most industries are facing decreasing marginal costs unless there are substantial investments, innovations. The financial industry is no exception, just think how much, what is the cost of a tweet or for, you know, something text or of, I mean, the type of information that I mean, can be spread so quickly, I mean, at a very low or zero marginal cost. In this context, I want to refer to this work by Rifkin, about this book, I mean, uh, when it talks about zero marginal costs, of course, I mean, you can agree or not with him, but I think it's interesting to, at least to, to know what, what they say is about this marginal cost ideas, no? which basically says that marginal costs are sharply decreasing while goods and services will not be for free. In the classical industrial organization theory, cheaper prices resulting from increased productivity or technological innovations mean more money left over for, consume, for consumers to spend elsewhere, which spurs a fresh round of competition among producers, among sellers. There is a bad anyway. These operating principles assume a competitive market. In the long run, however, new players invariably come along and introduce breakthroughs in technology that increase productivity and lower prices, prices for similar alternative goods and services, and break the monopolistic holding market. This could lead to an end game in which intense competition forces the introduction of even linear technology, boosting productivity to the optimum point at which each additional unit introduced for sales approaches near zero marginal cost, as I mentioned uh, before. In the context of the banking, and particularly the payment industry, network externalities and multi-sided 
platforms, I mean, are already in place for, for a long time. I mean, the credit card industry is a one of the most famous platform industry in which you have the, I mean, you have issuers, I mean, banks that issue the credit card, acquirers that are the ones that offer the, the terminal to the retailer, to the shop. You have the, uh, um, you have the platforms, uh, you have the, the customers, you have the shops. So, I mean, it's a multi-sided uh, market, like the video game industry or the, the you know, some of these TV satellite platforms. I mean, there are many uh, industries now that they are arranged and they are a platform. So, and they affect the competitive banking environment. In the old traditional competitive banking environment, when it was one-sided, when, I mean, one customer going to the branch, a change in the total production cost is shared between consumers and producers, which leads to a price adjustment, and always related changes in demand, which is basically a output or volume adjustment. However, in the new environment, in multi-sided markets, as more digital channels for banks uh, are, network economics cause a sharp decrease in marginal cost, and prices and quantities in one side of the platform affect prices and quantities in the other sides of the platform, which you know, is, 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 is a big change. In this concept, I mean, we need to be uh, we beware of many of the fintech innovations. Some platforms are not reducing marginal costs or do not really offer something new. This is a nice cartoon that explains some of the issues, no? some of the, I mean, yes, fintech is incremental or a line extension or too complicated or overanalyzed or copycat. So, I mean, we, we really need to identify which ones uh, are the, uh, the strongest no? and the, the one that can be, I mean, can be challenging for the, uh, for the banking industry. So what parts, what aspects or ingredients of this new economy can really be incorporated to the banking sector? And what should regulators care about? Going to the basics with the, digi with the financial digitalization, there is an intrinsic transformation of what the information means for banks, for financial institutions. Liberty and Peterson, in a recent paper, show that te the technology cha changes I mean, shocks are driving to a greater re reliance on hard relative to soft information in financial transactions. It's a critical point, actually, in this, uh, the topics that are covered in, in this conference, it's a critical point. I mean, the new the fintech, new technological innovations are driving to a greater reliance on hard information rather than the Previously, relationship lending, relationship in banking, soft information in financial transactions. It doesn't mean that soft information doesn't matter anymore. I'm not saying that, but it, this is a very important finding. Okay, this is changing. Will keep on ch changing the design of financial institutions by moving decisions outside the traditional boundaries of the organization. Okay, information can reach the bank in many ways. Non-financial companies that I've already referred to, such as Google, Amazon, Facebook, generate and store information and take advantage of the interaction made by the so-called creative commons, which is a form of accumulation and diffusion of knowledge and the provision of services through sharing in multiple media environments, such as social networks. Creative commons basically would be the people that participate in, in this process. Many of the providers based on creative commons, which are the ones that apply already operate through powerful platforms like Uber, for example, in the transportation industry. Okay? Some people argue whether Google would be the next, I mean, will, or Amazon will be the next uh, bank in 30 years, I mean, and they will take, I mean, it will not be that easy because at the very end they, um, they've entered much more clear through the product selling or, you know, fee-based business rather than credit. When we talk about credit, which is not that far from what they do, is when the, then regulators may say, hey, then you, uh, you, you used to look like, like a bank, but now you're a bank. So that's, uh, that's an important aspect that I will cover later. Banks in this context face important barriers to develop these in information technologies. They are not being so good, or free, whatever, compared with Google, Facebook, and Amazon. And why do they have more barriers? 
or they because they or typically they come from confidentiality and information safety safety when a service industry deal with systemic issues health financial stability creating this type of flat platform is not as easy as it may seem financial stability is a very important issue that banks worry about or the supervisor of bank worry about I'm not that sure that the big technology companies are so worried about financial stability. However, banks can still have a competitive advantage in exploiting their huge accumulation of information through big data. In order to exploit hard information or even to transform soft into hard information, some advantages of, big, of good big data management could be potentially useful. In managing these new information technologies, banks are facing also risks and adjustment that are common to many industries and easily observable nowadays. Cyber risks and the transformation of human capital, human resources, are probably the most important ones. We all concern, we are concerned about cyber security. I think that all this fintech business, all this financial digitalization process that has taken is very fast speed over the last five, seven years. Um, some people say that this is going to be even faster over the next three years, and in five years we could have a completely different model. My, my impression is that the only thing that can stop that very strong demand for these new financial fintech services and this new financial digitalization is a real problem, I mean, a very serious problem with cyber security that in a way, uh, makes the demand recede. People say, hey, this is not safe. Okay, So uh, that's why everybody is so interested in, you know, in keeping uh, the standards of uh, very high for cyber security, et cetera, and we get so worried when something happens. So some of the facts and figures, only in 2016, there were over 4,100 vulnerability detected information system that caused data breaches affecting 4.2 billion information registries globally. There are 3,000 data breaches every minute. It is important to consider that one of the information advantages attributed to banks in managing credit and market risk is their day-to-day -day market participation, but this only makes the amount of information that banks have to protect larger and larger. What about the human resources? Because we have, I mean, we'll say we've seen a decline, or, I mean, some banks are, have decided to uh, convince their, or, with, uh, through some arm twisting, um, convince their employees to uh, uh, to take early retirement or to leave. Uh, but of course, other type of jobs are needed now. Okay, um, as I say, in the case, for example, of the European Union, probably where due to the early overcapacity of the European banking sector, there was a larger need for restructuring. For example, in the in the European Union. Um, having cuts in the traditional branch-based jobs by hundreds of thousands since 2008, there have also been new positions generated to face the IT system transformation and the massive amount of regulation coming as a response to the crisis. Uh, I'm sure that regulatory compliance uh, teams are now double or triple what they used to be 10 years ago. Regulatory compliance and technology are the main new two sources of bank employment. The total headcount of jobs of banks on the stocks Europe 600 banks index was over 2,362,000 at the end of 2015, only 5.2 less than in 2017, which is a bit larger. What about the regulation with the fintech? With the emergence of fintech competitors, there are potentially great benefits to previously underser underserved segments. And there is a potential for financial inclusion, more competition, which is always healthy, provided we don't lose financial stability, new channels, new options. But it may also uh, involve high costs from destabilization, I mean, for losing the financial stability. This involves a challenge for the, for the regulator first and for the supervisor, who is the one implementing the regulation. How to regulate the financial, the fintech industry? Can we consider the case of the cab industry and the dispute with the new providers as a reference? What are, what are the options for Uber? What are the regulatory alternatives for Uber? Ignore them? Strangle them? 
regulate each innovation according to its preferred specialization? Perhaps the third alternative is the appropriate one in the case of the banking and fintech sector. Regulate activities rather than institutions, functions. That's what banks complain. That they are heavily regulated and they see, and or they complain because they see other big corporations that are very close to the type of business that banks do, including some sort of credit, which is basically involving credit risk, and they are not so regulated or they are not regulated at all. So it's important to keep in mind in this context that there are enormous social costs from failure of banking payment system, shadow si banking system, or any system that is not properly regulated, any financial credit system that is not properly monitored. Failures of individual components may not be disrupted. Not all the players may need the same regulatory framework to a level playing field. And regulation important for the system protection overall anyway. So we know that this is going, it's already happening. The Bank for International Settlements has already some uh, drafts about how to uh, intervene and how to regulate and uh, the European uh, Union, the European Commission and the national authorities are thinking about what to do, okay? But still we are in a very early stage. The last part I want to talk is about the, the case of payments, regulatory challenges and, and, uh, and the financial stability implications. And is the area where these new competitors have entered to the largest extent. Payment systems are an essential pillar of any financial or economic system and represent one of the largest industries worldwide. This is not surprising consider that there were around half a trillion non-cash payment transactions made last year. FinTech is mainly evolving as a part of the payment industry, or is a, I mean, it's one of the biggest pillars of, of, for FinTech. These payments are critical to the efficient operation of any financial system. Any problem in malfunction can create disruption and instability. Also, because of the size of the payment system, there is a concern that inefficiency in the system can act as a drag on economic development or economic activity. So the payments are critical to the efficient operation of the economic system. Okay? There is a report by Smidl and others uh, with the ECB that suggests that the cost to society of providing retail payments services can vary between 0.80% and 1.20% of GDP. There are relevant questions such as if regulation of the new provider should be comparable to that of a bank or could have a lighter touch, reduce capital requirements, regulatory sandboxes. Additionally, it is unclear whether the goal of warranting fair competition between all our new providers can be met and the proposed standard of current regulations basically I mean from, from Basel or we will need a new set of, of regulations. In Europe, the main controversies are around a very strong deregulating and liberalizing directive called PSD2, so-called Second Payment Service Directive. The main challenge seems to be ensuring a level playing field between bank and non-bank providers, as well as an adequate level of control and oversight over them. Dermin says that there is a need to assess the threat posed by digital banking as seen in the context of a long series of innovations in the banking sector that includes telephone banking, payment cards, the development of capital markets, internet, smartphones, and cloud computing. And of course, it raises public policy issues. Its impact on the profitability and solvency of the traditional financial intermediaries, the protection of borrowers and investors, as we have something similar of the deposit protection, and the systemic importance of the new players, the fintech startups specialized in financial services. Probably you know that the PSD2, this directive, initially pursues a single standard for all providers of payment systems that do not themselves take deposits or issue electronic money. The critical question here is how tight this standard is going to be. While PSD2 lays out general principles for equitable access, the implementation of this will ultimately be the responsibility of national regulators. In this transition period, there is, uh, we can ha have some suppliers of these services which are not fully regulated or treated the same way with credit institutions. We need to recall that rules for access will determine both the pace of innovation and the ultimate structure of the payments industry. We also need to remind here that firms such again, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, making use of payment solutions 
in as a platform to gain direct uh, customer interface for related products and services have a very important impact. This may imply that legacy financial institutions then might be relegated to serving as the back office to the platform, to these new payment providers. The importance of these questions of access and the rules for, I mean, for it cannot be, you know, ignored, cannot be uh, or, or stated either. So, conclusions, so well, I, have, I will be able to finish more or less on time, around 30, 35 minutes. From an academic perspective, understanding the economics of banking currently, today, requires a shift from the standard buyer-seller model, the one-side model, of standard industrial organization to models based on network externalities and multi-sided platforms with several related prices and cross subsidies uh, among different products. Digitalization and fintech, of course, are challenges, but are also an opportunity to reduce marginal costs and increase productivity in the financial services industry. However, there are also financial stability concerns attached to these processes as they imply a massive accumulation of intangible capital which is not always appropriately valued in capital markets. And they also blur the industry boundaries and create significant privacy, regulatory and law enforcement challenges. Given its systemic nat nature of in the financial and payment uh, system, the new activities and players in the financial sector cannot be regulated and regulate or unregulated or over-regulated or under-regulated the same way that other industries are doing, like the cab industry and social media. One potential solution would be to regulate innovation according to specialization, that is regulating activities rather than the players. Another important challenge for regulators is to ensure a level playing field between bank and non-bank providers, as well as an adequate level of control and oversight over them. There have been some regulatory initiatives, PSD2 in Europe, in this direction, but they are still far from ensuring that level playing field. Thank you very much.